Welcome back to the Centered on Buffalo podcast. We're joined by Pro Bowl tight end for the Buffalo Bills, Dawson Knox. Welcome to the show, brother. What's up, dude? Appreciate you having me. How's the uh, start of the offseason going for you? Um, besides painful watching other teams play, it's been great. Um, you know, getting the body back right, letting everything kind of calm down inflammation-wise, getting to catch up with a bunch of friends and family that I haven't seen in forever, um, trying to golf a little bit. It's been good. Where's, uh, so you're, are you down in Nashville now? Yeah, down in Nashville. So we're, I'm staying at a little place in Franklin. Um, I've got a house that I'm kind of refurbishing right now that's out kind of on Old Hickory Lake. And it was supposed to be done by now, but um, if you've ever renovated the house, you know how much things tend to get pushed back. So we had about, I think they had about six inches of snow um, and the whole city shut down for a week. And that was during the same week that we got about four feet in Buffalo. Right. And, you know, we were going to work the next day, but down here, you know, everything was state of emergency. So everything got pushed back a little bit, but, um, it's been good. Yeah. That's, that's generally how it goes. Uh, where do you play golf down in Nashville? Man, I don't, I don't belong to any club or anything. I just kind of play wherever my buddies want to. We, we bounce around all over the place. There's a couple good public courses. Um, I just played a really nice one called Vanderbilt Legends. Nice. It's where their college team plays all the time. And I think it's a paid membership, but it was a good course. It's been nice. No, that's cool. At some point when I get down there with some buddies that are members at Troubadour, I'll have to bring you out there. That spot's pretty special. <laughs> yes, have you been please. out there yet? Dude, that's my favorite course I think I've ever played. Um, just the food and the drinks that they have makes, I mean, you don't even have to focus on the golf. You could be hitting bad shots and still be happy. Um, but that, that place is beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. So for those that haven't been to Troubadour before, uh, you mentioned it's maybe less about the golf. So there's these hospitality stations, they call them comfort stations. They call them where you yeah, go in comfort. and it's bloody Mary bars. And it's the one day I was there is like a grilled cheese bar and you're loading anything you can on a grilled cheese. Then the next one has a totally different theme. And then there's bird houses throughout the course that all have drinks in them. So yeah, it's, it's, oh. it's, it's as much of a bar as it is a course. Absolutely. They they try to make you take a shot of tequila to start your round, no matter what time your tea time is. And then throughout the course, there's like a couple hidden, like underground coolers that you pull a little rope, a little uh, thing pops up and there's a huge cooler of just, um, I think it's Casamigos, um, just like bottles on ice with shot glasses. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a pretty fun course, but yeah, those comfort stations, you walk up and there's a guy on the grill making like brisket sandwiches for you to grab. And then you go in, there's shrimp cocktails, all these sandwiches. There's like soft serve ice cream. Um, it's like a resort, man. It's awesome. Right. It's that new age of golf. Like golf can be fun and we can play by the rules and we can have a competitive match, but we don't necessarily have to be completely buttoned up the entire time. You can have a good time as well. And I appreciate both ends of it. Like I appreciate, you know, the old school rules and all that. And I also can appreciate a day of wearing a t-shirt out at Troubadour and you walk up and yeah. there's a Casamigos truck sitting there planted on the first tee. I got invited to uh, their member guest last year and I couldn't make it because the bills were in London. Cause when you're the radio guy, I could still fly in Sunday morning. So I could have made it work, but the bill, oh, if, if, if it was any week besides London. So hopefully I get that invite again, because I hear they go all out for those member events, but oh uh, yeah, all right. Uh, what were your thoughts on the Super Bowl? Uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. It just happened on Sunday. As you watched it, besides being bitter that the Bills aren't in it, what what were your thoughts coming out of that game? It's pretty incredible to watch what the Chiefs have been able to do. I mean, they're building a dynasty. I think they said three of the last five years they won a Super Bowl. Um, so I, I think they're just they're they're the new standard in the NFL. And if you gotta if you want to be the best, you gotta beat them. Um, they've been running the AFC for a long time, and now you know it's pretty clear that they've established a dynasty. So I think they're gonna have a target on their backs for everyone. But um, it's definitely a good standard to chase. It's yeah, as as you mentioned, definitely painful watching. Um, but I think just the consistency in which they've been able to play at a high level, even, you know, this season, they went up, they went through some ups and downs during the year. Um, they probably had a lot of question marks for themselves, but they just find a way to pull it together at the right time. And um, it's very impressive to see what they do. It is. And it's painful because 
when you look at two of those Super Bowl victories, the Bills had them on the ropes, and so in the playoffs, and so and I say on yep. the ropes this year, it's a missed field goal, it's a you know a couple missed plays down in the red zone late, but that's how small the margin of victory is, especially in the AFC right now with all the good quarterbacks. And then you look at that Super Bowl, and it looked like the 49ers hadn't beat the entire time, but it reminds me a lot of the ways that the Patriots would get it done. They kind of wait for you to make a mistake. They score touchdowns generally when they get down in the red zone, so they capitalize a couple drives a game. Now they're playing really good defense with all the draft capital they put on the defensive side of the ball, and they just don't make that you know final mistake. They, they make a play at the end, and now we're talking about, you know, it goes from Tom Brady to Patrick Mahomes. I forget the exact stat, but it's like 14 of the last 16 Super Bowls have had uh, uh, Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes in it. It's like, it, it's sickening. But when you look at the Bills, yeah, absolutely. It, it is sickening. But when you look at the Bills, uh, so close and there's no reason to not think that a similar run couldn't happen with a couple of breaks going a different direction, but sticking on that for a second, do you think that Travis Kelsey's the best tight end in history? Man, his stats back that up for sure. Um, I think he's the only, I saw some stat where I think he's the only tight end and receiver that has over a thousand yards for the last six seasons. Now, I believe um, I could be misquoting that stat, but um if you just look at everything on paper, what he's been able to do, it's been absolutely incredible. Um, I love watching him on tape. And it's crazy because he's not the most athletic guy. He's not the fastest, but he's just so smart when it comes to football. He knows how to find the weaknesses and zone coverages and just sit down and wait. And he knows how to use man coverage. He knows how to use the leverage against whoever's guarding them, whether it's a corner, safety linebacker. He just has played so much and he's so smart that, I mean, just his football IQ is off the charts. I think that's what makes him so good. Just that chemistry he's developed with um, Pat Mahomes. It's um, definitely something I want to emulate a little bit. Um, but in terms of greatest tight end of all time, you know, I, I, I feel like you have to throw blocking in if you're right. going to talk about the greatest tight end of all time. So in my head, Gronk is the best just because he was he was able to get in line, move DNs off the ball, um, and then what he was able to do, obviously catching and then running after the catch. Um, he's pretty hard to beat there, but purely stats, man. It's I think Travis probably is the best to ever do it. Right, and you make a great point because – if you're talking about him as a receiver, he's not the best receiver of all time, but they don't ask him to block a whole lot. This year is funny. Um, I caught wind that one of the reasons that he blew up on the sideline early in the season on, on Andy Reid was that they were having him chip so often. And he was like, look, if you want me to chip, get better tackles because – look, I'm a receiver and the offense was really struggling at the time too, which brings out frustration in everybody at those times. But part of the reason was because they were asking him to chip and actually block on those plays. And then one thing about him in zone coverage, I had Chad Henney on the podcast before uh, the Chiefs Bills uh, regular season matchup. And he was saying that uh, Travis Kelsey, he has freedom within some of the routes with some of the play calls to literally find the open zone. And then Patrick Mahomes is obviously reading it like a quarterback. Travis Kelsey is a former quarterback. You are as well yourself. But, you know, when you understand zone coverage, they see the leverage, and then boom, as soon as he sits, Patrick Mahomes knows where he's going with the football. And then Chad was also talking about how the way he goes into his break that – him and Mahomes have so much chemistry that he knows what he's about to do out of the break immediately. And so a lot of that's chemistry, quarterback and tight end, some of it's intelligence. And then you're right. Like when you look at him, like he doesn't even have a vein sticking out of his arm, but then he also runs with some physicality and he's just like, I, I almost think like the strength of his athleticism is just like his looseness that like he can get in and out of breaks. He can kind of flail his body because he's so loose and that allows him to be athletic on the field and more athletic than most of the uh, linebackers and safeties that are tasked to guard him. Man, it, it's wild because, yeah, like you said, just looking at him, you're like, oh, he's, you know, just your average guy. I mean, obviously he's, you know, a large human. But um, one of the most impressive things to me about him is he seems to just have, like, eyes in the back of his head too. Like when he catches the ball, he seems to know exactly where the nearest defender is and he turns away from him. Um, and he's got this really 
just incredible knack for yards after the catch. So, I mean, you know, he could be running full speed one way, and as soon as he catches it, turns back, and you're like, I, I don't even understand how he knows, but there'll be someone right behind him, you know, assuming that he's going to turn the way he catches it, but he just reverses upfield and gets another 10 yards. That um, I think it's something that isn't talked about for him enough, his yards after the catch. But, and I, I think that chemistry that he's established um, just can't go understated. Like you said, like you could have no idea what route he's running, but somehow Mahomes just knows exactly when and where he's breaking. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool to hear him talk at tight end you every year. He kind of, he'll, he'll get up in front of everybody, go over some plays um, and he likes kind of comparing himself to Picasso, you know, like Picasso's got the painting of a human, but one ear is up here. And he's like, you know, it's a human, you know what it is, but it might not look like the traditional painting. Like, he, you know, it might look like a seam route and it's supposed to be a seam route, but there's going to be little tweaks here and there. And at the end of the day, he ends up in the right spot, whether it's, you know, just traditionally running a seam or just getting to the spot in which he'll be open on a seam route. It's, it's really cool to watch. Um, it's definitely hard to imitate. Yeah. So he, I heard him talking about the play where he threw it to Kadarius Tony, but Kadarius Tony's lined up offsides, the end of the bills game. Look, and everyone's talked about that play enough, but it was interesting in the playoffs. I heard or prepping for the super bowl, one of his media engagements that asked him about that play and how he knew that he could throw that ball in that moment. Cause really he's not looking in that direction long enough to say, Hey, I'm going to throw this ball and make a very risky play, which ends the game. If this doesn't work out. And he was talking about based upon the coverage, he knew where the safety was. And when he saw the corner from that side of the field, start to pursue him and Tony wasn't blocking. He said, I knew he'd be sitting out there somewhere. And then I just found him and winged it. Like in that moment, it wasn't pre-planned. They didn't work on it in practice, but he felt all everybody converging on him and thought, okay, well, there's no one outside on that side of the field. We got to have a guy over there and he wings it out there. And that's just like spatial awareness, almost like a great point guard where he knows where every player oh, yeah. is on the court, whether, you know, he, he's got vision on everybody or not. And yeah, I mean, he, he's pretty it's remarkable and there's a lot more to him than just the physical attributes. And that's, a lot of times in the NFL, that's what makes the best of the best. It's like, yes, you have the tangible qualities, but then it's all those intangibles that separate you from the rest. Let's let's talk about yeah. your season this year. You have the wrist injury. How tough is it? Look, every time I got hurt in my career, besides once I did an MCL, I was out for the season. And so how tough is it, especially getting surgery, to then bounce back mid-year and then hop back in the lineup? Yeah, man. I mean, it was... There are a few ups and downs here with the wrist. Um, it was something that I thought I could play through at first. It happened in London, um, finished the game, and obviously it was super sore going into that next week. But um, I was able to do enough in practice to where I was thinking, you know, if I'm at 80 percent, it would be better than if I'm you know, not playing. And at the time, um, the scans didn't look bad enough to where I needed surgery. Um, and I wasn't at risk of really hurting it a lot worse. So I was like, you know, I'll tape it up, get out there and do what I need to. But um, it just got to the point where I didn't feel comfortable catching the ball. I was having to body up everything and even blocking. Um, it just got so painful that I, I played, I believe, two games after that. And after that Patriots game, I realized like, it's just, it's not going to heal on its own. The best thing to do for me and the team is just to get it fixed. Um, but yeah, missing those six weeks, it's hard. Um, cause you got to stay invested. You got to be learning the installs at the same time, doing all the extra treatment, getting there early before everyone else leaving after everyone else leaves. Um, and just making sure your body gets right. That cardio part's hard. Um, thankfully it was a upper body injury. So I was still able to run, but um, you definitely feel like you, you got to fight twice as hard just to kind of stay where you were at. Um, but thankfully, our trainers and team doctors, strength staff, everyone's pretty incredible. So um, I feel like I didn't um, miss too much. I wasn't too rusty by the time I got back out there and it came back pretty quick. No, you made an impact right when you came back. And when you were out, then Dalton Kincaid, he got a bunch more reps. What's your relationship like with him? And and I asked this, uh, I wouldn't ask if I didn't know it was a good one because I could observe it. I'm observant enough to see that you guys have a great relationship, which says a lot about you that you've had a lot of success early in your career. The Bills reward you with a 
big time contract at the tight end position as far as numbers go. And then they still uh, draft a guy in the first round. So I know that's tough and that's not an ideal situation, but it seems like you've embraced it in stride and that you guys have a great relationship. Yeah, man, I can't say enough good things about Dalton. Um, he's He's been so fun just to get to know off the field, too. I mean, he's just a down-to-earth guy that if you met, you know, at a restaurant or at a bar, you would have no idea that he's a, you know, really incredible NFL tight end. Um, just the way he carries himself, he's funny. Um, <laughs> he's really funny, man. But just that down-to-earth kind of humility he has is pretty cool, but... Um, they actually told me, they came to me, I think a day or two before the draft and they said, Hey, look, we just want to give you a heads up. If Dalton's available, we're probably going to take him because we don't have a high enough grade on the other receivers. Um, we think he's going to be the best passing option to come out of this first round. Um, and so obviously you have mixed emotions, you know, as a football player, you always want to be the guy. You don't want to be, um, competing with anyone for snaps or anything like that, but, um, they told me, you know, the direction we kind of want to go to is more 12 personnel stuff, have both of us out there on the field at the same time. Um, and, and I've, you know, I, I think it's been a pretty cool experiment trying to get to know, you know, how we can get him the ball, let me have my role as well. And I think that's something that'll grow a lot more going into this next year too, because it started with um, Coach Dorsey. And then while I was hurt, um, it changed to Joe Brady. Um, and I, he's another guy I can't say enough good things about. Everyone absolutely loves Joe. Um, so I think having a whole extra year to prepare and get everything going this offseason, um, it's going to be fun to see what he does with the offense going forward. Yeah, no doubt. How excited is the group? And, and you just said your sentiments about it, but as a group, how excited is everybody to get Joe Brady back? I've been there when there's been interims before and you know, a lot of times the, the guys in the room are politic and for that guy to come back, whether he comes back or not, that's up to the guys upstairs. But how excited are you guys as a group to have him back? And then I'm not going to ask you what changed. That's not fair to Dorsey or anybody else. But and, and look, you're running a lot of Dorsey's plays. You can't install a whole new playbook. But what was maybe just different, you know, uh, personality wise, maybe when Joe Brady takes over? Yeah, Joe definitely carries himself as kind of like one of the guys. Um, it's amazing the energy he brings every day. He wears shorts every day at practice, whether it's, you know, five degrees or 50 degrees. He's always out there in shorts, always out there getting the guys going. Um, and one of my favorite things about him is the two-way channel of communication he has with everyone. He makes it very clear that he wants all of us, whether we're, you know, a starter or maybe a backup guy, any position he wants um, that two way street of communication. So if there's a play we might not like or understand, we go to him with it. He either takes it out of the game plan completely or adjusts it a little bit to help us, you know, kind of understand what's going on. And we added um, a little kind of offense only meeting without any of the coaches um, on Fridays where we'll just go over the game plan, talk about stuff we like, talk about things we don't necessarily like. And Joe does a great job taking that, um, advice from us and kind of tweaking his game plan according to what we like. And I know um, Josh loves him too. So he, he gets the stuff called that Josh likes, um, which I think is one of the most important parts. You know, if you got a, you know, arguably the greatest quarterback in the NFL, um, you want to call the things he's most comfortable with. So I think that um, relationship between Joe and Josh has been awesome and it's only going to keep getting better from here. Yeah, I, I liked. I always liked when offensive coordinators would allow the players to have buy-in, and I always felt like our offense was to do better, especially in those plays that we recommended. And not that we were way better at choosing which plays, but the players have to own it. Like if Josh says, "I want this play in the game plan," and it wasn't previously, or says, "Take this out." put this in instead well now he's got to make that work or else next week he knows that i'm not going to get that privilege again especially right. when you're an offensive lineman when you're like hey you need to run this play <laughs> next series because you know we're getting this look up front well up front we're thinking to ourselves like okay when that play's called we have got to make this work or else we're getting no say the rest of the year it's going to be five step and seven step drops you know we're getting no we're right getting out. no say in this so we better make this work so i always loved when uh those guys would let us have some impact and yeah. some input throughout the game. All right. Uh, we talked for a minute uh, down in Miami, um, and and I was asking you a little bit about 
uh, the McDermott situation. And I wasn't trying to be nosy. And you guys know that like anything you say to me is not going to end up on air period. This is like, I don't do the job to have breaking news stories, but you, you said there was, you know, kind of a rallying around coach. Like he obviously was defeated by the situation. You could see it in his actions, his demeanor throughout the week. And Look, I mean, you go on a six-game win streak. That's hard to do in the NFL, including a playoff win. So did anything need to be said, or was it simply like, hey, coach, we got your back. Let's let's go. Yeah, I think it was one of those things where he, he had to address it. Um, but I, I think I can speak for almost every single person on that team where we we know that we had his back, and I think – couple of people spoke up in front of the team telling them, we got you, coach. Don't worry about it. It's in the past. Let's leave it there um, and let's move forward. So, I, you know, everyone loves coach. Um, he's done an incredible job. And it definitely was a rallying point because that, that's the crazy nature of the NFL, man. It's everything so public. He's always in the spotlight. Um, and just the pressure and the way that that can weigh on someone is really intense. Um, so obviously – you know, he was. He said a couple things in the past that he regrets the way it was interpreted or the way it was said. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you know, he's a human. You know, he can't be perfect. We've all said things that we regret um, or things that are misconstrued in one way or the other. So I think it's it just made it relatable. You know, if you're a human, you've messed up in the past. So um, we definitely had his back. We were able to move back or move past it pretty quick. And I think it was a good rallying point because when we were six and six, I believe that's when it all started coming yep. out. Um, yeah. Timely, timely uh, posting of that yeah. article then. Yeah. Yeah, man. And uh, clearly um, something clicked with us and we were able to go on a run. Um, but I, I know I can't say enough good things about him as well. And I've really enjoyed playing for him. Yeah, that's great. And, and, Look, I knew everyone would have his back. You know, there's so much you can't control in the NFL, but to then rally around him and then go win six in a row was pretty special uh, in that moment when there's questions. And look, this is all external talk, not internal talk, but externally it's, okay, is his job safe? Okay, well, here, now we're going to go rip off five wins in a row to end the regular season, grab the two seed after some disappointing losses early. And, you know, then there's no questions about that at all. First playoff game right. against the Steelers. You guys, the game gets delayed. There's a travel ban. And I haven't talked to anybody about this. How hard, besides the coaching staff, which I knew what they were doing, but uh, what was it like for a player? Because generally you have people in town. You like getting, I always liked getting away to the hotel and kind of just get away from everything, clear my mind. But now you're stuck at your house and you're trying to prep for a football game. Like, what were those couple days like during that travel ban and then getting ready for the game? Yeah, man, it was crazy. It kind of um, gave you a little PTSD from COVID, um, you know, having impromptu Zoom meetings and um, just having to like stay loose and stretch at the house, um, just kind of winging everything, you know, you can't control how much snow there's going to be or the fact that a blizzard came through and we had to delay the game a day. But um, I think that's just the nature of our team in the locker room, too. I mean, there's been so many things that have come up that throws a wrench in what we thought it was going to look like for the year um, that we just had to kind of adapt and adjust on the run. And hats off to all of our staff, um, the guys behind the scenes making things work, changing the game time, making sure we had everything we needed. Um, it was it definitely kind of had that COVID feel to it of not knowing, you know, when the game's going to be, if we're even going to be able to go in the facility. And then, like you said, having to stay at the house, um, you know, the day before the game, which is definitely new. Um, and my parents, my parents were actually on the way up. Obviously, flights got canceled. They flew into Cleveland, rented a car. And then um, over the course of that day or two, they had to drive from Cleveland to Buffalo in between the um, snowstorm. So, um yeah, thankfully, it wasn't like I was trapped in the house with a ton of family. Um, so I was able to still, you know, concentrate and do what I needed to do. But um, it was definitely, definitely a very memorable one and um, even more fun that we won. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, you throw all that in the mix and then you're a touchdown favorite. And you don't win that game. Then you're sitting there thinking, man, that was really unfortunate timing and unfortunate right. circumstances. But you get the win and everything's OK. You do lose a little bit of rest time for the next game, but it is what it is. You get out of there with a win and, you know, you just do what you can to rally for the next one and get your body back right. 
uh, one more, and then we'll pop in a couple uh, couple of Western New York questions at the end, a couple of fun ones. But you've had some of your most successful games in the playoffs, and so you come alive in, in big moments, and um, you know you've kind of touched down in what three straight years to start the postseason. Is that what it is, or is it four? Um, I actually. I think it's every year but my rookie year, so four. Yeah, so four in a row, start the playoffs with a touchdown. Everybody always wants to know, look, we know that catching a heater from Josh Allen's tough. It, how much tougher is it when it's freezing cold outside? <laughs> Man, you got to keep the fingers warm. <laughs> um, once those fingers start going numb, it gets a lot it gets a lot worse for you. So um, the equipment guys do a great job. Like I, I even have a little built-in pocket in my jersey that I put a little hand warmer in. Um but honestly, the the worst thing is the uh, if the wind is really whipping, um, you know, because that ball can move last second like a knuckleball. Um, but his, you know, arm strength is incredible. So he's cutting through almost any type of wind or weather we got. But there is that added concentration that's needed whenever it's snowy, cold, rainy, windy. Um, but thankfully in Buffalo, we got a lot of experience with it. So it was definitely harder um my rookie year second year but as you get used to it um and as you get used to catching balls from him um it gets a little easier just with time and with practice your touchdown catch to start the Patriots game a couple years ago in the playoffs did you think Josh was throwing that ball away because he said he was throwing it away and you just elevated and caught it what were your thoughts on that play so it turned into a scramble drill and we always talk about building the box in the end zone you know you got someone front pylon back pylon um but yeah he he was scrambling out i was the only one on the back pylon and his body language looked like he was throwing it away right um but as the ball was in there i'm like that thing's just floating up there i think i can go get it um and thankfully um it was a perfect place ball and i was you know we were super excited I get to the side, I'm like, dude, thanks for just throwing it up to me, believing in me. Um, and he was like, I didn't know what happened. Like, I, I didn't even, I wasn't trying to throw it to you, number one. And number two, I couldn't see because he, like, got carried off into the sideline. So he's on the opposing sideline. He just hears the crowd go nuts. And he's like, was it an interception? Like, what happened? Um, so after he saw the replay, I mean, we were both just really happy it worked out. But it, it was one of those funny things. Like, no, it was not planned, but... Um, sometimes it's better to be lucky than be good. Yeah, no doubt about that. All right, what's your favorite golf course in Western New York? Oh, Cragburn. Yeah, a place is solid. I'm actually I'm doing Cragburn. the I'm doing the 117, the 117 holes in a day there this summer. So I might not like Cragburn as much uh, after <laughs> walking 117 holes, but it's for charity, and so uh, we'll raise some money and do that. Plus, I like a good like. I know that's not like running a marathon or something, but it's going to be one heck of a physical challenge. I think you walk like 30, almost 40 miles in a day playing golf. Dude. So, I mean, hats off to you for doing that. Every time I hear about people doing that, I like, I, I can't wrap my head around it because even just in the cart for 18 holes by the end, I'm like, all right, you know, it was a good day. Like I'm ready to go. <laughs> like I don't even have another nine in me, but walking 117, I mean, in a way, that's got to be harder than a marathon. I mean, because your mental state of having to be locked in to hit golf shots and then walking, like you said, 40 miles. I, Man, yeah, hats off to you, dude. I don't know if I could do we'll that. Pretend, we'll pretend like it's harder than running a marathon. It's It would be easier <laughs> than walking a marathon, I guess, but because uh, it's more distance, but uh, yeah. a little bit more fun doing it that way. All right, are you Nashville hot chicken or buffalo chicken wings? a great question man um i mean i feel like they're so different that's a, um, that's, that's a nice political if answer. i could only pick one for the rest of my life i go buffalo wings what's your um, what, we'll start here what's your favorite uh nashville hot chicken spot prince's nice um i think they're the original um they used to have a little hole in the wall family-owned shop that you know they'd give you your fried chicken in a paper bag and, you know, the bottom, by the time you're, like, ready to eat, is soaked with grease. They serve it on the Wonder Bread, on the piece of white bread. Um, and it's so good, man. But that's, like, you know, that's the full chicken breast. So you're, you know, really digging in, which wings, it's a little easier to just eat one at a time. But I think if I had to go with one for the rest of my life, I'd stick with the wings. Yeah, I would, too. And I am a fan of Nashville hot chicken. What's your favorite wing spot in Buffalo? Got to go Barbell. That's been a I popular mean, choice. What's number two? 
You know, wing nuts has really grown on me. Um, the, uh, what is it? The garlic honey. Um, when you get those things fresh, it's good. You can't let them sit around for a while. But another, another one of my favorites that recently I went to was uh, Gabriel's Gate. Yep, solid. Man, I mean, it's hard to go wrong with wings in Buffalo. I feel like you could go anywhere and get some pretty incredible wings. I know, but. we talk about that all the time because the reason I say it is, Look, if you don't have good wings, then you're going to go out of business if you're trying to sell right them because you you can't get away with it because there's so many good ones up there. We uh, Before the Chiefs game, Jason Kelsey came and he was like, let's get some wings before the game. I'm like, well, I got to be there three hours early, so let's just meet at the big tree. I'll get us set up there. And he's like, well, do they have good wings? I'm like, everywhere's got good wings, but they're yeah, going to be good. No he, he was trying them. He's like, man, these are incredible. I was like, there are better wings. This is about as good of an atmosphere on game day and getting some wings that you're going to get. And you can just walk to the stadium after oh, all these buckets of beers you guys are knocking down. So this is going <laughs> to be the most convenient. But yeah, so we took them to Big Tree. And then you got to know, are, are, call. I, I, you're, I know you're not from Western New York, so not everyone has embraced this. Are you blue cheese or ranch? <laughs> so I grew up ranch, like down south everyone you know there's very few places that have good blue cheese so i was always ranch my rookie year went to barbell asked for a side of ranch and they looked at me like i had two heads <laughs> i mean they're like what like for the fries like you want ranch for the fries i was like uh yeah yeah for the fries um but barbell was actually the first place i really started liking blue cheese it's just so different like down here we don't have actually you know good homemade blue cheese like everyone in Buffalo has, but I've turned into a blue cheese guy. I mean, mulberry, incredible blue cheese. Um, but yeah, Barbell was my first experience actually enjoying it. And it definitely, it turned me to the good side. You know, I'm not, not asking for ranch any, any, anytime soon. Yeah, no, you, you can't do that in Buffalo. And yeah, Buffalo will get you to like blue cheese because their blue cheese is different. Uh, first off, congratulations uh, on the engagement. How cool is that? You Thank you. Meet, meet the girl of your dreams up in Buffalo. So special to be able to do that. Stage of life, still young and all that. So congrats on the engagement. Uh, is the well, wedding this offseason? Yeah, this offseason. Um, we're doing it in Nashville. Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's just been an incredible year. I mean, the Lord has provided beyond my wildest imagination. So it's been absolutely amazing um, from our first date to where we are now. Um, it's crazy how time flies. I mean, we've been dating for a year now um, and she's absolutely amazing. So we're, we're super excited. I feel like the next few months is going to fly by too. And before we know it, we'll be married. Um, but couldn't be more thankful for her um, and everything in this been going on this last year. Man, that's really well said. One of my favorite Bible verses, Ephesians 3.20, down unto him who can do immeasurably more than I could ever ask or imagine. So Immeasurably, uh, man. Yeah. More than I could ever imagine. Well, so when you're engaged to a personal trainer, fitness influencer, does your diet change? <sighs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I guarantee I started it. the offseason with a three-day juice cleanse. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is never something I thought I'd do. Um, Which is perfect for cutting out the inflammation. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're taking ginger shots and turmeric. Um, she's definitely been encouraging me to have a nice wedding diet. Um, but at the same time, like I, I'll, I'll tend to lose weight if I'm not eating enough. So I kind of convinced her, you know, I can eat this Chick-fil-A sandwich because I need the calories. Um, so it's a good give and take. Um, and I probably have a bad influence on her as well. Um, you know, because I'm ordering two appetizers with an entree and two sides at every dinner. Um, and at first she tried to keep up with me, but, um, she, <laughs> she does a great job keeping me healthy. No, that's good. Yeah. I, I imagine that was the case, but yeah, a little give and take rub off on each other in a good way. Yeah. All right. Last one for me, talk about the impact that working with the punt foundation and all that you've done with them, uh, over the years, talk about the impact that working with them and in the children that are battling cancer and their families talk about the impact that's had on you. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't be thankful or couldn't be more thankful for everyone at Pont just for the opportunity to make a difference in the community. Um, it started my rookie year. Lee Smith got me involved. Um, he took me to the hospital. I got to meet everyone that worked for Pont. I got to meet some of the families that were in the hospital with their kids. And I mean, just seeing a family that's dealing with one of the hardest things you can possibly deal with in this life. Um, just being able to bring some smiles to faces that haven't smiled in a while. And, you know, 
no matter who you are, if you're playing professional football and you put on a Bills jersey, um, these kids are going to look up to you. I remember when I was a kid, I looked up at Titans players here in Nashville like they were superheroes. You know, it didn't matter to me if they were scoring touchdowns or riding the bench. I mean, those guys were literally superheroes in my mind. So I kind of I try to remind myself of that, even if I'm, you know, pissed about the game or if, you know, I wanted to have more catches than I did or I didn't, even if it didn't go my way, I got to remind myself, like, I have this platform that God's given me to be able to give back to other people. And I think that's just a small way I've been able to kind of give back to such an incredible community. Um, and there's there's been some awesome relationships we've built. Um, but I couldn't, I mean, there's no way to have more respect um, for Gwen for Jonathan, Lindsay, everyone that works at Pont, because they deal with that every single day. Um, you know, they're getting late night calls and they're they're on it. It's a full time job. And I just get to do kind of the one percent of the work where I get to show up and shake hands, bring some smiles, bring some gifts, go to fundraisers. But they're in it every single day. And it's it's heavy work, um, you know, because there's so many question marks when it comes to pediatric cancer. And that's something that's weighed on me for a while because um, it, it was several years ago. I have a cousin who thankfully he beat cancer. He's he's good now, but he had a very scary run in with a rare form of bone cancer. And you can see that no matter where you are as a family, whether you're, you know, living in a mansion or if you're living, you know, in some and, you know, if you're just really struggling in life, cancer brings you down to the same level. Right. You don't know what's going to happen. You can't just go buy something that's going to fix everything. Um, it brings you down to the same level, man. It's the great equalizer, I think, is what Lee Lee calls it. But um, just seeing how it affected my family, um, it, it's scary, man. So I think just every chance I get being able to see some of those kids, being able to donate any time and resources and kind of just raise awareness, um, I think are, are the most important things, but so thankful for them. Um, and we're actually starting to work on doing some stuff in Tennessee too. So it's been pretty awesome. Cool. No, that's really cool. Way to use your platform. You said it best. I mean, you put on a Bills uniform in Buffalo. It just gives you a platform. And then how to use that platform for good outside of what you're doing on the field is, is ultimately what's going to make the, the, the most lasting impact. And so it's no awesome that you do that. And those, I know those families and I know many of those folks over there, we split a, a suite with the fund, uh, with the punt foundation for bills games. And so I, I get to see it maybe more than you do because you're playing football on Sundays and, and working throughout the season. So I probably get to see it even a little bit more. So uh, thank you for all you do for those families and for Western New York, because it, it truly does make a difference. So uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time, brother. It was awesome catching up. Would love to catch up on the links maybe uh, this offseason, whether it's down in man, Nashville, up in Louisville, that. maybe down in Florida. We'll figure it out. Oh, I would love it. Just let me know, man. I'm yep. there. My man. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you.